welcome to this Evocative Sounds video. My name is Clara and I'm a summer intern here at the Vancouver Arts Quilkin Society. And this summer we were working on Project Terracoya, which is exploring how we can build intergenerational connections through multiliteracies, which refers to our abilities to use our senses in sight, sound, gesture, and spatial arts. I am working on the project Evocative Sounds, looking at how music and sound can be used to better understand ourselves and one another. Um, I have with me here today, Ethan Hine. He is a doctoral fellow in the music education program at NYU and adjunct professor at the NYU and New School. He's a founding member of the NYU Music Experience Design Lab, where he has taken a leadership role in the development of online tools for music learning and expression, most notably Groove Pizza, which we will be exploring today. So thank you so much for joining me here today, Ethan. My pleasure. Um, can you please explain for us a bit about what Groove Pizza is and sure. what it's all about? Uh so the Groove Pizza comes out of my experience teaching myself how to program beats uh, by trial and error over a period of many years. Um, and the challenge with uh, drum machine interfaces is they present time in a line from left to right. Um, and that doesn't give you any indication of like why you should put particular drums on particular beats. Like I figured out by trial and error, all right, if you have 16 slots in your groove, you should put the snare drums on slots five and 13. Mm. Why, right? I, they sound better there, but why do they sound better there? Mm. Um, and I read some ethnomusicological work um, by people who were like showing rhythms on a circular diagram rather than a linear one and showing, mm -hmm. you know, actually the rhythms that people like uh, have certain geometric uh, properties when you see them on a circle. And I was like, oh, these are really cool. But what if they were interactive and you could like hear the rhythms? Uh, and that's where the group pizza came from. Very interesting. I didn't realize that it had a specific cultural background. It's uh, a non-Western thing, I imagine. I mean, the the people who, the, the work that I was reading was studying uh, rhythms of West Africa. Okay. Um, but a lot of, I mean, since most, you know, pop, dance, R&B, hip hop music in the U.S. comes kind of eventually indirectly from West Africa, um, it, it applies pretty generally here too. Of course. And how did you find that making beats in a circular pattern like on Groove Pizza allowed you to access new parts of your creativity? Uh, Okay, so there's a rhythm that is really common around the world uh, called son clave, and it goes like this. And when you see it from left to right, it seems like this kind of arbitrary pattern of uh, 16th notes and eighth notes. Um, but then when you see it on a circle, it's just a pentagon, like tilted on one corner. Hmm. And you're like, oh, a pentagon. Uh, and then as you rotate the pentagon into other orientations, it makes these other super widely used uh, Afro-Cuban patterns. Um, and that was just a way more intuitive um, you know, representation for me than like, oh, but if it's two eighth notes and then a 16th, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that pretty much any pattern that looks good on the circle also sounds good. Yes, I love how as, as well it's so accessible and you can just tweak little things and play around with it, which might be harder if it's in a line. Yeah. So with that, we thought today for an interesting experiment, we could see Ethan in this process using the group pizza with music that I have sent him, um, music that I've made. And I told him the time signature so that we could um, just jump right into it. And that way we can really see this all in progress. So if we could start with that. Sure, so the first thing I'm gonna do is go over to Ableton Live and I'm gonna bring in your loop, which I have never heard before. <laughs> I'm just gonna drag it in off my desktop and let's see what we got here. Let's... 
got some road like keys in there. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, Zoom makes everything slow. There we go. Perfect. All right. So this pattern is just kind of a generic one. I'm going to get it out of here. Uh, I'm going to switch to the hip hop kit just because I like how it sounds better. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a simple kick drum pattern that's just four on the floor. It's just quarter notes. Next thing I'm going to do is put some snares on the back beats. to transition into really having this as being a visual for beats like when you put the shapes together can you hear mm -hmm. the beat uh no i mean we uh this thing existed for a while before we put in the shapes menu um and it was actually just a pleasant surprise to discover that if you drop a pentagon or a hexagon onto a 16 slice uh pizza it always sounds good uh, that was not like a plan of ours. That was just a happy mm -hmm. discovery. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just something that emerged from having the thing and and just playing around with it. Um, I mean, it's like if you're making music with a computer, you're using visual representations no matter what. 
Mm -hmm. If I go back to Ableton and I put a beat under the loop in like a more conventional way. You know, so I'm going to make a drum machine under there. Um, and I'm just going to draw it. This is a visualization, right? This mm -hmm. is a visual representation of sound. And like this waveform is a visual representation of sound. Um, this squiggle as the, you know, the showing the loudness of the sound, um, the gain meter is a visualization of sound. All these things are visualizations of sound. Um, I mean, music, Western notation is a visualization of sound, right? Like there are a lot, of, there have been historically a lot of different attempts to make sound visual. Um, so it, you know, it, with something like the Goof Pizza, it's not like we invented the concept of trying to make sound visible. It was just like, well, here's a slightly different way to visualize it than the ones that are in these existing pieces of software. Do you think that there's anything about it being um, circular that changes the perception of the music in a way that you wouldn't understand if you're just doing it linearly? Or is it mostly just accessibility for moving things around quickly? Oh no, you discover all kinds of interesting things on the mm. circle. Like, so uh, we have some specials over here. These are preset rhythms. Um, so here is, uh, this is the drum pattern from Billie Jean by Michael Jackson. And But even without hearing it, just from looking at it, you're like, oh, it's very symmetrical. Yeah. Um, this is probably gonna be a predictable kind of simple, accessible pattern. That right. doesn't mean it's a it's a bad pattern or a dumb pattern. I mean, that's one of the great songs of all time, right? But it's definitely going to be predictable. So this would be a measure of 4-4, four, four, right? Yeah. And then um, divided each, into 16th each number would be a 16th note. Right. And then in this case, with the hi-hat in the middle, that would represent eighth notes. Exactly. And then now you could yeah. also... I mean, you could also count, you could also think of it as being two bars of eighth notes at twice the tempo. In an earlier version of it, we had a menu where you could have the slices be numbered one and two and three and four and like their eighth notes or one E and a two E and a like their 16th notes. But ultimately we decided to just leave it like agnostic and let the user just interpret it however they want to. Right. But yeah, identifying like the the tactus, like the beat level is actually like pretty complicated and people tend to intuitively hear it differently. Um, even in the same piece of music. Right. So yeah, part of the beauty of the visual thing is we're like, look, when you get around the circle, that's that's one time through the pattern and you can name the subdivisions however makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But so yeah, that's Billie Jean. But then the next preset we have in the menu is Chameleon by Herbie Hancock. Mm -hmm. And even without listening to it, right? Just from looking at it, you can see, oh, it's going to be similar, but... This one is going to be more complicated feeling. Like it's more, it's less symmetrical. It's more, it's, like it looks like somebody like dropped Billy Jean on the floor. <laughs> um, and so when I play it for you, um, yeah, from that great Herbie Hancock record, Headhunters. Um, I love the feel on the um, just right before beat four, which I guess would be five, and it's like feels rushed. Uh, yeah, I feel like maybe with the groove pizza exploring around with it, maybe that it's it's easier to find different sorts of drives as you play yeah. around with it and make things maybe less symmetrical and 
and uh yeah um and there's another there's a feature of it that i'm particularly proud of which is the way that it represents swing um so uh, I'm going to take the swing of chameleon and just turn it to zero. I'm going to add some more 16th notes just to make it a little more obvious what's going on here. I'm putting the kick too. Okay, now here, watch what happens when I turn on the swing. Oh, yeah. Right, and then if I back it off a little bit. So swing is something that is, you know, it's been considered to be this like mystical, indescribable thing for many years. Um, and a swing is a very complex phenomenon, but like the simple, the simplified version of it is you're just making every alternating beat and offbeat longer and shorter. Um, and Every drum machine and every digital audio workstation can apply swing at this point, but they rarely show it. So you have to just sort of feel what it is by ear. Uh, it's, um, and we were like, okay, what if we just change the grid so that, right, like the even numbered slices are getting, right, the, the grid points here are getting further away um, just so that you can, you know, your ear get some visual reinforcement for what's happening as you change the swing. And you can see right now that there's swing in there, the spacing of the hi-hats is all uneven, right? And that, that, that unevenness, that's the thing that gives it that particular kind of lilting rolling quality. And if I take that off, so everything's even. <laughs> it does not sound as good. Yeah. I mean, you can make straight grooves sound cool also. I mean, you know, like Latin music doesn't really ever use swing and, you know, mm -hmm. That music sounds terrific, but yeah, it's a, it's a very different aesthetic, right? Interesting. And what are some of the other features? Um, um, that are so fun? you can change the time signature by changing the number of slices. So uh, if you wanted like triple meter. So this is a 12 slice pizza now. Um, let's see if we can make funk work in a 12 a time. Uh, and if you want like an odd time signature, like here, I'm going to do 13 8. It's like if you're in Bulgaria or Macedonia or somewhere. There we go. Your, uh, your, Bul your Bulgarian and Greek friends will be like, oh, yeah, I'm feeling this groove. <laughs> uh, and it's also possible to make patterns that are more than one measure long. Um, so here, I'm going to go back into four, four time and, uh, and now I'm going to duplicate this pattern into a second bar and change it. All right. So we're in the first bar we're in the second bar, first bar, right at the bottom there. Bar. Okay. Um, and then once you are done with your beat, uh, first of all, you can share this with people just by copying and pasting the URL, this address at the top, this string of gibberish at the end is a unique identifier for this beat. So if I were just to just copy and paste this in an email and you clicked on the link, then it would open with this pattern. Um, but you can also, if you wanna work on this in like another piece of software. Um, so like, let's say I wanna bring this into Ableton, I'm gonna download it as MIDI and it's saving a MIDI file on my desktop called Groove Pizza 94 BPM. So I'm going to go back over to Ableton. And here I have my little drum machine pattern and I'm going to delete it. And instead, I'm going to bring in my Groove Pizza pattern. So there it is. Oh, that's funny. It's. Uh... I brought in all this time signature data, which I do not want. Let's get that out of there. All right. Um, and now I can use like any of Ableton's drum kits.
of it mostly in the different types and then you can put any right? Yeah, so, I mean, MIDI is just a music notation for computers. It's just telling the computer, look, I want you to play this note at, and this mm -hmm. note. And then I want you to play this note, then this note, then this note, then this note, and this note. Um, right. And you can play it, play that back on any instrument. I mean, you can play it back on the piano if you want. It might sound a bit odd, but like, <laughs> so here's how that sounds on an electric piano. Actually, not really very audible. I'm going to bring it up a couple like this. Yeah. Actually, sounds pretty cool. <laughs> I should hold so, on to that. That's actually a pretty nice uh, pattern. In in creating Groove Pizza, what is your dreams for how it could be uptaken by the world? And what do you think the positive benefits could come from that? So um, the original concept for it was to make it as like an iOS app, an iPhone or iPad app. Um, but we quickly realized that it would make more sense as a web app because it's if it lives in the web browser, then it's usable on literally any kind of computer, phone, or tablet. Like it works on an iPhone, it works on an Android phone, it works on a Windows tablet, it works on a Chromebook. Like, um, and that's just impossible with, you know, if, if you're doing like a native piece of software, like you'd have to write the code over again for each new thing that you wanted it to be available on. Um, you know, and also the fact that it's on the web means, um, people can just be like, oh, I found this thing. Let me send you a link to it. Uh, and so we keep track of the usage. And I mean, I think it's been used like 1.8 million times nice. like in every country in the world at this point. Um, and like it, the server like logs all the sessions so you can like see like, oh, a person in Azerbaijan made this beat, um, which is miraculous. I mean, mind boggling. Um, and we yeah. know it's being used by like music teachers all over the place. Um, so yeah, I mean, I really just want to like, you know, it took me 10 years to figure out how to program beats. And, you know, my wish is just to make it easier for people to figure it out. Because it's fun, right? Like, it's a, it's, it's a super useful thing to be able to do. Um, you know, if you want to write songs, if you want to make tracks, if you just want to like practice over something that's a little bit more interesting than a metronome, if you mm -hmm. want to understand how rhythm works just intellectually, you know, mm -hmm. for all those purposes, like drum programming is super useful. Um, and so, yeah, the idea that like, you know, people who might load up Ableton and be like, I can't, I don't get it. I can't figure it out. Um, mm -hmm. and might give up. Ideally, you know, if they hit the groove piece, they're like, oh, this makes sense. I can do this. Oh, and then I can just like say this is MIDI and then bring it into Ableton and, and keep going from there. You know, hopefully mm -hmm. that that like playfulness and accessibility is a motivator for people to mm -hmm. keep going. With trap music, when the hi hat is repeated really quickly, uh, I, I forget what that's called. Uh, um, when it's yeah, like, it doesn't really have a name. That trap hi hat. I know people call or people call it like the the lawn sprinkler. When it's okay. like, oh yeah. When it's like and super it, super fast. Mm -hmm. Is there an option for that in group pizza? So the way that we do that in the Groove Pizza is, again, this is why we were like agnostic as to what the slices represent, because you could, if you wanted, think of them as 30 second notes. Oh, okay. um, so I'm just gonna, um, get all this stuff out of here. Let's get this bar out, no one wants the first bar. So what I'm gonna do is just put a kick on one of uh, kick on slice one. I'm gonna bring the BPM up a little bit. Kind of funny under rock kit. <laughs> yeah, it makes a little more sense on the 808. All right, so okay. this would be, well, let's make sure to get the swing off. Uh, you wouldn't want to. Right, if I put two kick drums up, there we go. Yeah, so that's how you would, uh, that's how you would do trap. Now the Groove Pizza, it's a beginner level tool. Like if to really do trap, you need to be able to do triplets and 64th notes. Uh, mm -hmm. And the Groove Pizza does neither of those things. So for that, yeah, you would need to get into Ableton or FL Studio or Logic or something a little more full featured. 
Mm -hmm. And um, for people who are beat makers like you and super popular amongst youth, especially, what do you think that we would um, experience artistically and in our senses that people who don't think about beats would not maybe understand? Uh, so <laughs> Western culture, like the, the cultures descending from Western Europe tend to really overvalue uh, melody and harmony and don't think about rhythm enough as being like an important thing. So you very often see, you know, people like being like, oh, music, the most fundamental, you know, components of music are melody, harmony, and rhythm. That is not true. The only one of those that's actually fundamental is rhythm. It's perfectly possible to have music with no melody and no harmony. Um, so my favorite rap song uh, is Sucker MCs by Run DMC. And it's, you know, these two guys rapping over a drum machine and some turntable scratching. And there's no, I mean, I, I guess you could say that the, you know, voices follow pitches, but they're not like specific piano key pitches. And there's definitely no harmony, but it's music. I mean, unless you're like Ben mm -hmm. Shapiro or somebody trying to argue that it's not. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it's a thing that, um, yeah, people in like the, the culture of like, especially classical music I mean, it's a thing in classical music, but it's definitely like just part of the background. It's, you, you blow past it really fast in music theory yeah. class, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, it, and there's this idea that like, oh, rhythm, it's just for the body, right? Like, it, like harmony is where like the intellect lives. And that's, that's just racist, right? I mean, that's, there's nothing to that except for, you know, this atavistic idea from Europe that, you know, white people were superior. You, know, you get into rhythm and it is fully as complex as harmony, if not more so. I mean, yeah, <laughs> like we've only been talking about like, you know, beat subdivisions and swing, but then you get into micro rhythm, you get into rushing and dragging, right? Because humans don't play perfect metronomic time. Humans are always like a little bit ahead or a little bit behind, um, no matter how good they are. And the ones who you are probably really heard that. Good, <laughs> No, and the ones who are really good do that on purpose. Right. Um, it's like you, like Questlove, right? If you listen to him talk about playing the drums, he will talk about mm -hmm. like, well, I'm deliberately lying behind the beat. I'm deliberately yeah. playing late for this laid back feel, or I'm playing yeah. ahead to give it this kind of urgency, this rushing feeling. Um, uh, there's this whole thing called drunken drummer in hip hop. Uh, the descends from Jay Dilla where mm -hmm. you stuff is off on purpose. Not off because you're sloppy, but just off pushing against the metronomic grid to create just this kind of tension. Right, or like right, that, right before a downbeat or something. Yeah, and it, it does yeah. the same thing that dissonance does in harmony, right? Right. Um, and, you know, the beautiful thing about the computer is that it, it is much easier to like understand these things because you can see them on the screen. Like I'll, mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna go back to Ableton. Um, so here is my favorite uh, favorite breakbeat. This is the Funky Drummer. Um, this is from a James Brown song. And just from looking at it, you see how this snare drum right here is a little late? Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be on beat two and it's pretty noticeably late. This snare drum is supposed to be on beat four. It's pretty early. Um, and if you can see all of the, all the drum hits, all the onsets are a little bit off the grid, but they're off the grid in a way that sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, and I can, I can fix it. Like if I quantize it, if I just snap everything to the closest, metronomic grid point. It's a little bit more boring. Yeah, it loses. It makes musical sense still, but it just doesn't have the flavor. Yeah, so I'm gonna take all that out. All right, here's the original groove. Yeah, wow. so it's, I mean, you know, I, like anybody can feel, oh yeah, that, that feels good. But it is very nice, especially from like a music teacher perspective to be able to say like, oh, it's cause he's got this snare drum that's a little bit late. 
And right. if I wanted my stuff to sound like this, I could make sure to play my beat too a little bit late. Mm -hmm. How do you think that drummers are able to learn this super nuanced stuff where if they didn't get it quite right, it could just maybe sound like an accident or something? Like I just, it feels like something that you would be, you'd feel in your body and you drive it. But also like you're saying before, um, with everybody, like it's so hard to be exactly perfect, but I guess drummers, that's what they're good at. I don't know. It just seems like I don't, I don't think I could ever do it. <laughs> No, me neither. I mean, yeah. I, um, but it did, you know, doing all, I, I will say this, like doing all this programming um, and beat making in the computer actually really helped my timekeeping on instruments as well. Interesting. Just like being attentive to it, just thinking about it and being able to like visualize like where the, where the um, drum hits fall made me, I'm a guitarist mostly. And it made me conscious of like, oh, this strum is where the snare drum would be. And this snare drum mm -hmm. is where the kick drum would be. I don't actually have to play all the time either. Right. Like, you know, just like it, uh, like, oh, now that I can feel the time more confidently, I don't have to keep time with my hand. I can like let some time go by. Um, and mm -hmm. that actually sounds better when you do that. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think yeah. are the positive, maybe psychological benefits for people who are engaging with rhythm or like, do you think that they learn things in, in making beats or, or being a drummer or even playing in time with other people that helps them in other parts of their lives? Oh, sure. I mean, so there's this whole field of music therapy, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, it's well documented that like musical participation is good for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is not shocking right to anybody who does this like yeah when you you know when you leave like choir rehearsal or whatever you feel good that's not you're not imagining that that's a real thing um but like so when people are like recovering from illnesses or accidents um uh, as it turns out like listening to music or even better participating in music helps them get better faster uh helps people with pain management um, if you have like a brain injury, it helps your brain like rewire itself faster. And I mean, again, like if you're a musician, you're like, well, that makes obvious sense. But it's nice to know that there is some actual scientific support for it. Um, but so, yeah, with rhythm in particular, this thing of like synchronizing your body movements to other people. And it doesn't just have to be through drumming. I mean, dancing does it too. It's just a good way to feel connected to a group of people. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, you know, the stuff, it's not very hard to understand, but, you know, in our society, we don't dance a whole lot. White people don't. Um, my African-American friends and Latin, you know, Latino friends dance all the time and are consequently kind of better at happiness than we are, I find. That makes sense. You also have a lot of experience with music history, music culture. Do you find that certain types of sound, whether it's certain types of uh, rhythms, translate to specific cultural values that maybe would be openly, like collectively known or not really talked about? Yeah, I mean, so drums, right? I mean, drums have a very powerful cultural history um right so in like uh many kind of christian societies they were forbidden yeah Interesting. or like tambourines were okay because it mentions them in the bible hmm. so tambourines are acceptable but like drums that's like for the devil right that that's like <laughs> sinful music you know whereas in like uh in west africa like you know drumming is like a form of like religious observation Mm -hmm. Right. It's like it's yeah. the form that the worship takes is drumming in a circle. Um, so, yeah, that's very, uh, two very different ideas about what drums mean. Right. And in the U.S., I mean, there's a horrible history of, you know, slaves not being allowed to possess drums because they were afraid they were going to like, first of all, they were afraid that they were going to communicate with each other using drums. Um but all, or yeah, I don't know exactly what the fear was, but they, you know, they deliberately suppressed uh, the, you know, these musical cultures. Um, and fortunately, th that wasn't 
like that ban wasn't enacted everywhere. So in New Orleans, famously, right, they didn't ban drums. And so there was Congo Square where, uh, mm. you know, enslaved people, Native Americans and white people would like get together and drum. Um, and it's a good thing that happened because that, you know, is where our entire popular and art music culture comes from, right? Mm -hmm. All the jazz, hip hop, R&B, funk, rock, country, uh, all of that stuff, uh, you know, descends from these rhythms with some harmonies and some other stuff from Western Europe also. But I think it's really the rhythms that that's, that's what makes American music distinctive, you know? Mm -hmm. And I guess with rhythms as well, because in Vancouver, there's also sometimes like drum circles on the beach. And I love how anybody can just join and it's always super inclusive. And because it's just basic rhythms, it's easy to get involved and just feel like you're a part of something. And I feel like even if it's even if it's just you're just doing like basic, maybe each quarter note or something, mm -hmm. then you still get that experience of feeling like you're contributing to a, a group activity and it's like an aesthetic experience. It doesn't even necessarily attribute to like certain lessons or morals. It's just about being in the moment. I feel like that would be a really good release for I don't know, social tensions or something. Yeah, no, again, I mean, yeah. this, you know, like like I said, the music therapists use this stuff in, in healthcare yeah. situations for a reason, like it, it is effective. Um, yeah, and so there's uh, um, there's this idea in ethnomusicology is descends from this guy, Thomas Torino, who said, okay, there's presentational music cultures and there's participatory music cultures. And That's so actually where I found you. I was, oh, really? I was writing about that and I, I was reading your article about that. And I was, yeah, super curious, like, how can we make participatory music where it's more casual, people can just join in, especially in North America or, or certain cultures in North right, America? Right, because we, we are mostly a presentational culture. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the participatory cultures, like, they're, um, so, like, West Africa, traditional West African societies and, like, different parts of Latin America and other parts of the world, um, participatory music has certain formal aspects that make it work. And one of them is right, like uh, what we say in music ed is low floor, high ceiling. So like the low floor is right. If you don't know what you're doing, if you can just clap, mm -hmm. then you can meaningfully participate. Or if you better yet, if you can cap, clap like the bell pattern, like, like that's a little bit more involved. That's not hard, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then there's a high ceiling. So if you're a virtuoso drummer, you can you be- just go improvising around and, yeah. and leading and uh, embellishing and doing all these things. And that there's sort of many different levels in between. Right. Um, you know, as opposed to like, you know, I'm like learning some like Bach violin music on the guitar right now. And it's the most beautiful music in the world, but man, the floor is high. Right. Like it is, it takes years to even just get in the door to begin it, right? right? Um, Why do you think it's socially important to have the low floor? Again, it's just a practical thing. It just makes yeah. it possible for people, right? That, yeah, you can just wander by on the beach and jump in. Mm. Um, you know, and that I don't want to say that you know these these uh, drumming forms are simple or unsophisticated because they most certainly are not. Of course, are not. But there is a level at which a non virtuoso can meaningfully participate like that's mm -hmm. the main thing and you know like our popular culture has that too like when people sing along with the mm -hmm. chorus of the pop song that is a participatory thing right that's what pop music is for um or even like those little famous dances that come along tiktok like, dances exactly yeah <laughs> no, that's a beautiful <laughs> participatory counts. culture yeah yeah i think um, it right like um, yeah, and the point is you do not have to be like an Alvin Ailey level mm. dancer to be able to do them, right? Like you got the, the low floor. But then to be really good at street dance, you do have to be an Alvin Ailey level, you know, kind of virtuoso athlete. So what would be your dream of where participatory music could go, let's say in America? In I mean, I would just like it to be a routine part of life, right? So yeah. like... Uh, I have uh, my, my friend from middle school, Albert, shout out to Albert if you're watching, um, <laughs> was telling me like, you know, so he's from, uh, his family's from the Dominican Republic. And at Christmas, they like get together and sing Christmas carols and they drum. And like everybody does it, like the grandma's drum and the kids drum. And it's not like a big thing. 
It's just what you do, right? Mm -hmm. And I would like music making for us to be as ordinary as like cooking dinner right? or like going jogging. I guess that's kind of where the literacy part comes in because we're yeah. studying multi-literacies. And the idea is that it be, just becomes a part of you and it becomes a part of your expression that you're comfortable with, but in your daily life. Like when you're reading, it's not like you're thinking about reading, but it, <laughs> <laughs> but then oh, it's like the, an ability that you learned when you were yeah, a kid you just do just it, and then because you got, have those base skills, it actually allows you to go so much further because then you can absorb all the content. What if it was like that within music culture, where we we like, or not even our like people who maybe don't have this in their lives? Um, what would it look like to maybe? try a few new things out whether it's with rhythm or just using your body or basic instruments and then once you just maybe integrate that into your life somehow in a new way that opens up all these other doors for amazing experiences yeah I mean I, I like know. it's there are some obstacles in the U.S. and in Canada um, okay. because we do have this like this history of puritanism right yeah uh, this idea that like these these bodily things are sinful um right. and that's that's a steep hill that's a steep obstacle to overcome you know and there's a reason that like we associate these kinds of like groove drum based musics as like transgressive or like you know oh those hippies on the beach with their drugs and their drum circles or like oh those jazz musicians with their drugs and their you know, interracial marriage, like, you know, that it, these things have always kind of occupied this like marginal right. um, space in our society. And yeah, it's just really hard to like disengage with this history. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there, I, I've seen some studies saying like, look, um, again, in, in West Africa, like drumming, it's a religious uh, activity. And there is, it is a direct challenge to our like religious, our, our basic religious value system. Mm -hmm. It's good. It reminds us it's kind culture. of a construct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and like, oh, you yeah. know, and I'm not like a very religious person, but even so, like I was raised in a context and like it, you know, it's hard for me to just drum with people and I'm pretty good at it now, but it's still, you got to overcome anxiety and kind of self-criticism and this feeling mm -hmm. that you're doing something that doesn't, it's inappropriate. So yeah, that's going to be a tough one to unpack. Yeah. Well, um, when I was writing about this, we were mostly thinking about it in public spaces where people can join in. And what do you do if other people just are not comfortable? with the music in the public space. And um, one of our, our group members in the organization, he's from Iran and he was playing just on his Bluetooth speaker, um, Sufi music. And somebody came up to him and was like, you, like he was saying all this stupid shit, like you should turn this off. And it just really hurt his feelings. And he was like, I don't understand because if I can't even just be myself in public and play my music, then like the whole question was okay well how do you overcome that and what do you what do you do to um make people maybe more open-minded to experiencing music that they didn't that, that haven't heard before because that also related to the multi-literacy part maybe this guy he just heard, hadn't heard music like that before. Yeah. And it just put up all these defense mechanisms. But it's like, why? <laughs> like, you know, but it's interesting. Like, I, what do you think could be ways to kind of come o overcome these musical prejudices? I mean, education is a, would be a start. I don't think it's the only thing, but it's definitely a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my whole, like, like I went to grad school for music technology because I wanted to like make music software to make it easier for people to like make and participate in music. And I did the Groove Pizza and that was awesome. But like, I found out that the obstacles are not technological. It's, it, it's social, mm -hmm. right? It's cultural. And like when right. I, the work that I've been doing since then has been on like anti-racism in music education mm -hmm. because 
so much of the difficulty here pretty much just comes down to like the history of Europeans and Africans and the way that Europeans justified the slave trade and colonialism to themselves by saying that like, we are the superior beings, they are the inferior beings. We're actually kind of doing them a favor by bringing civilization to them, honestly. Um, we have to undo that mm -hmm. or we can learn to value the parts of our culture that come from Africa, namely drumming, right? Groove-based music. Yeah. Um, and it's gonna, I mean, so it's happening, right? I mean, definitely anti-racism is a red hot topic in music ed right now, boy, all around the world. Yeah. Um, the resistance is stiff. <laughs> People have feelings about this, boy, like, uh, but I'm hoping that the resistance is a sign that progress is being made, right? That like, right. that, things are changing and change is very threatening and, and you know, people are fearful of it. And so I'm hoping that all this anger and fear that's circulating around about like critical race theory and all this stuff, I'm hoping that it's a sign that actually the ground is shifting. Um, and mm -hmm. some of these obstacles are kind of falling away, I hope. Nice. Um, so with your deep involvement in music culture, where do you think music could be heading in the next decade? Like what sort of sounds do you think would emerge? Whether it'd be more um, in hip hop or pop or other genres? Um, so I think like the voice, I think like people using technology to like manipulate and process their voice is gonna be a bigger thing. And it's been a thing for a while now. So like, if you think about like auto-tune, right? Yeah. Um, like turning your voice into this kind of robotic synthesizer. I think that is the the beginning of something. Like as I, you know, as I listen to like pop radio and hip hop, I'm hearing like all, now all these like weird sampled processed vocals, like, mm -hmm you know, just like little snippets of voice kind of used as like a texture or like a percussion in addition to people like just singing normally. Mm. Um, and like in hip hop, right, there's just so many different like vocal styles other than just straight singing or rapping. Like there's so many just sounds with the mouth and the throat that are, you know, that are in these songs. Um, you know, and it's getting to the point where, you know, using software like, you know, uh, the people who make autotune and Tares, they also have this thing called the harmony engine where you just sing or talk and it comes back to you in four part harmony, <laughs> right? Like this right. stuff is so effortless now. Right. Um, I'm, I'm really curious as people just play with it and experiment with it, what uses they're going to find. Cause like autotune, right? It wasn't meant to make you sound like a robot. It was just meant to make you sing in tune, yeah. but still sound like a person. Right. And this thing of like the, you know, the robot voice is a that that was not intended by the software's designers at all right that's the interesting part when all these unintended things emerge yeah and you can see where it goes and there's like a history of this right so like in rock you know um the electric guitar it was not meant to distort and feed back it was just meant to be like an acoustic guitar but louder mm -hmm. interesting um, and the idea was feedback or distortion that meant your stuff didn't work correctly you know, and so it took like Jimi Hendrix and people like him to realize, ah, actually, if I feed my guitar back on purpose, it kind of sounds amazing. Um, you know, or like hip hop, right? Like you're not supposed to do this with a record player. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, so I feel like, yeah, there's a whole, there's a long history with these technologies of using them in ways that were not intended. And yeah, I'm really curious to see what happens with all the voice manipulation software. Do you have any thoughts on music accessibility for people trying to start if they're if they're beginners so this is a good time to be a beginner um i mean you have never been better supported as a beginner like i mean if you have a phone um then there there are like a million apps available for your phone um most of which cost less than five dollars um so like on iPhone, on iPhones, there's like GarageBand, which I think is free now. I think they just charge you for like extra sounds. GarageBand is amazing, fantastic, a full professional level thing, but also pretty accessible to just kind of playful poking around. 
Um, there's uh, these things called Soundtrap and BandLab, which run in the web browser, and they're pretty popular in like music ed contexts. Um, and again, they're very accessible. If you just get in there and start clicking around, you're going to make discoveries pretty quickly. Um, you've got just infinite books, YouTube channels, Wikipedia, like, um, and there's a lot of nonsense, right? And sort of confusing, poorly written, like, uh, stuff out there also. So you gotta, you know, you gotta dig, but, um, yeah, there, there have never been so many paths up the mountain. I don't think. Do you think though that it's harder to get big or maybe people can blow up really quick because of the internet or with Spotify, it's harder to make it like a career because of the, um, <sighs> Yeah, the, the business of it is pretty bad. Like there's no middle right. class. There's like a couple of superstars yeah. and then there's the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, that's not so good. I, I don't know what to say about like the economics of it. Right. I mean, my feeling is few people make money, make real money from it anyway. Like all your favorite indie rockers, they all have jobs or trust funds. Like nobody makes a living off of that unless they're huge. Uh, so like my kids, in my kid's school, one of the parents is the drummer from this band called Guster. Like, so he does not have a day job. Like the drummer and Guster, they tour every summer and they're popular enough that like he can actually, he well, and then he's married to somebody who has a normal job also. Um, <laughs> but like Guster, they're big. I mean, I have cousins who are super into Guster all these years later after their first, you know, hits. So yeah, if you're on that level, it's possible. But for most people, like, uh, just yeah. learn how to write JavaScript or something also, because mm. uh, yeah, the economics of it have never been great and are right now really terrible. But also my feeling is like, it's like cooking, like you don't have to be a professional chef, you should still cook, right? Oh, I'm putting all my music on Spotify and the streaming services Heck yeah. at the end yeah. of August, but I'm not even kidding. So much of it, I literally recorded off my phone <laughs> and it's like not good quality, but I had it all on a SoundCloud and a lot of my friends, like nobody really listens to that unless you're into that scene. Yeah. So I'm putting it up anyways. I'm sorry, but oh, well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like you know, it's, it's definitely like a golden age for the amateurs. I feel bad for the pros, but I mean, for the amateurs, my gosh, it's delightful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited to have my stuff being accessible. Nice. And um, turning more to the oral per perception side, mm -hmm. in your experience with music pedagogies, are there any tools that you know that help people listen better? Because something that we also want to bring back to our audience is things that they could use in their own lives when them themselves are listening to music or even as well with soundscapes just outside. Uh, there's, a, there's a website, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it to you because it's cool. Um, it's called the Chrome Music Lab and Uh, it only works in Google Chrome, um, but uh, there's a thing in there called the spectrogram. And what it does is just analyzes the frequencies of whatever is coming in off the computer mic. Uh, you should be seeing it. Okay, so what you're seeing right now is my voice um, in terms of its frequency content. So if I sing, oh, 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 um, and what's cool about that is that you can see all the overtones. So if I sing like, pretty cool, yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's fun to play with the Chrome uh, and, and uh, you can play music into it and it's real interesting to see just like what the frequency content is. And like DJs yeah. use stuff like this. Um, the, all the DJ programs like you know uh, Tractor and uh, Serato have these um, spectrum analyzers. So you can li literally see, oh, here's where the bass is and here's where the high pitch sounds are. Um, yeah, I love that kind that's of stuff. Neat. Cool. That's good to know. If you're watching this, go check that out, Google Chrome. Nice. 
And um, lastly, is there anything else that you would like to share with people maybe who are a part of music who or who don't play an instrument but love music to help them get the best out of the sensory experience and as well how it can be used to build new connections in our case intergenerationally i would like us to forget the concept of the guilty pleasure hmm. um i think that like silly pop songs are very valuable as hmm. like social just social objects right like you know my daughter who's five is super into um party in the usa by miley cyrus <laughs> loves that song and we can sing that song together hmm. uh and like uh, she loves, you know, do a deer, a female deer from The Sound of Music. She mm -hmm. She's learning to play it on the piano with her index finger. That's you know, cute. I mean, that kind of song, like talk about the low floor, you know, mm -hmm. accessibility for participation. Um, that's what that stuff is for. And I think it's sad that people of good taste are like Miley Cyrus. And I'm like, you know, like I like Bach Art of Fugue too, but I can't do that with my daughter. Right. You can't, it's not participatory. It's presentational. It's very beautiful and very valuable, but you know, we need to learn to, you know, we have all the, all these great pop songs and dance songs and disco songs. I mean, disco is great. Love disco. Um, yeah. And all the, you know, the TikTok dances, like we have all of this vast wealth. We just have to learn to appreciate it and mm -hmm. see its value. And instead of thinking of it as like a guilty pleasure, think of it as just like a super useful technology for making ourselves happier. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that comment, especially because if there's things that are more accessible to groups of people, like songs that most people know, it's so awesome when, when you can build that connection with everybody and, and let that moment happen. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ethan. It was yeah, super neat seeing on um, Pizza Groove. I'll I'll link Pizza Groove as well in the bio for this video. Okay. And um, feel free to try it out. It's pretty fun just to play around with it. I know I'm in the beginning of my beat making journey and already it's definitely made me think about things differently in a super useful way. So thank you so much.